thank you again for joining us today for our Bible study in the book of Hebrews chapter 5, and let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for that you continue to, to help us make progress in this book, as complex as it is. We pray that you open up our heart to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we continue our study in the book of Hebrews, and as I mentioned to you, Hebrews is a really complex book. I hope that you have taken the opportunity to take out and print out my handout that is on the Facebook pages and announcements for this Bible study. It will help you manage your way through the book of Hebrews. We believe that Hebrews was probably a sermon that was preached and that was written down. We don't know by whom, by whom, but it was just such a beautiful piece of literature that will truly touch your life and transform you. God truly spoke through this uh, preacher, whoever he or she may have been. And so today we turn to chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. But remember, all of this is in context. We can't take this stuff out of context. We might come up with the wrong things, which is why I provided this handout for you. So the first week when we looked at this, we looked at the week 1, chapter that, uh, about God's revelation, God's word that was spoken into this world. Okay, and that's the first part of the book of Hebrews the first chapter through the second chapter, and then we reveal to us the revelation. Big surprise to us, we're, those of us who are Christians, we know that Jesus is ultimately the one who fulfills the, God's promise to the world, the messianic uh, uh, promise that God has made is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so now he talks about who Jesus is, that he is God's son, the heir, and our brother. So we have a we can have a very intimate relationship with this messianic figure. Oh, but then, in more than just a messianic figure, is a way of faith. The way of faith, uh, and this is the uh, section that we looked at last last week. The way of faith is marked with a lot of trials and tribulations, but as brother, as the one who boldly went to the throne. We have access to the grace and mercy of God to see us through these difficult challenges. And then we get into day, the next section, the, that, and this is where he makes a really bold cl uh, claim. Jesus is the only source of salvation. Now those of you who know me know that I have a great deal of respect for people of faith even those who are not Christians. Many Christians do not share that respect with me. But I have a great deal of respect for Muslims. I have a great deal of respect for Buddhists. I have a great deal of respect for Hindus and for Jews. I do think that they are seeking out the same God. They are not satanic or possessed people because they believe in God in a different way than we do. I believe they are trying to seek for the exact same God. I also, so God loves them. God respects them. I also believe they have some wisdom that we can learn from them. But the one thing that we have is that we understand that ultimately Jesus will be the only source of salvation. So that means if a Muslim is going to be in heaven, it will be through Jesus. If a Jew is in heaven, through Jesus. Because Jesus is the way that God has made the means, or the means possible for us to be in heaven. This is what this section is all about today. So I want to make sure I'm clear with that. But I think what happens is some Christians then, well, if Jesus is the only way, then they're all going to hell. That's not what the Bible, that's not what I'm saying. And I don't think it's what the Bible says either. Okay? You're taking one step too far. The people I think are going to be in hell are religious leaders, in particular Christian pastors. <laughs> hell is made for us. Why? Because we like power and control. Because we like to make people jump and give money and do all sorts of things that have nothing to do with the Bible. Okay? That's why. We like our position and power. Those are the people whom, whom uh, Jesus... Condemned. Jesus never condemned people of other faiths. Never. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. Old Testament, you get some of that? 
Not in the New Testament, not Jesus. But Jesus is the only way. So let's go on. So in today's lesson, we get the three qualifications that make Jesus the worthy source of salvation. So the author of Hebrews is really trying to go into this very intricate, layered approach to get us to understand uh, this. So he, he starts up here and he kind of argues like this, kind of in a curly cue. He just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and building and building and building this concept of who Jesus is, trying to take on every argument that you would say, well, come on, Jesus can't be who you say he is and so forth. So he's taking on every argument he or she possibly can. And so he gets to the point where he wants to show us the qualifications that make Jesus the worthy candidate, the only one by whom uh, to, who, who could be the source of our salvation. And so that's today's lesson. So let me read you Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> Every high priest is selected from among men. So again, he's acknowledging that there might be many high priests. Why am I claiming that this, if you remember last week, we said that Jesus is the great high priest. I should put this here. The great high priest. One and only Every other one is a pale comparison. How can he say that he is the only great high priest? So he's going to tell us this. So every high priest, little high priest, <laughs> the little guys who actually do it in the earthly temples made with human hands, okay, they're selected amongst men and appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin, okay? It's a calling God has placed upon their life. A high priest must be called by God. Aaron, the first high priest, was called by God. Jesus is the high priest called by God. Okay? He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant, who are going astray. Since he himself is subject to weakness. Weakness. Now remember, we looked at that last week. That term weakness. Jesus identifies with us because Jesus himself went through times and periods of weaknesses and, and temptations. Uh, it is normal to struggle with weaknesses and these types of temptations in life. It's not a sin. We go to God. We have the boldness to be able to go to the throne that we learned last week's lesson because Jesus is the great high priest and is able to do that for us. So he has compassion for us. He deals gently with us. Okay? He deals gently with us. This is why he is to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as sins for other people. What? Okay. Not talking about the great high priest. He's talking about every other high priest that came before. So he's setting us up for what makes this one different. Okay? So the three qualifications so far that we've learned... Of the three, we've learned that the high priest is appointed. He's going to argue that Jesus is appointed. He's going to argue that the high priest must have compassion. You can't be a high priest if you're pointing your finger at everybody and condemning everybody. Help, because you realize you fall underneath the same judgment of God. You must make sacrifice for your own sin. Get your own stuff together. Okay? They're no different than anybody else. You might be called by God, but you're still the same type of person. You know, I thought, I've often thought, if we in the Christian church could actually deal with sin in a, in a way, in a manner where we actually came to church every Sunday and said, oh, oh my life is just a mess. Any other person, oh, it's kind of like an AA meeting, my life is a mess too. And then we could actually support each other. But what it is, we come and hide these things from each other. And we act like we're perfect, and therefore we can't talk about things. Jesus is compassionate because Jesus too struggled with these, with our you know, weaknesses. The great high priest, the high priest did. Okay? Because they're subject to these weaknesses. Now, I don't believe that Jesus sinned, that says so in the Bible, but Jesus struggled. 
So this is why, verse 3, he has to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as the sins of the people. For no one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. Okay, now he's, so now we know he has to be appointed. He has to be compassionate. And a high priest must become one. He must identify with us. These characteristics are what makes a high priest a high priest. Okay? According to Hebrews. But now he's going to say why Jesus is not just a high priest amongst many, why he is the great high priest. And this turns right here in verse 5. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said, you are my son. Today I've become your father. So he's appointed, right? And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Who the heck is Melchizedek? <laughs> well, Melchizedek is this very um, peripheral character in the Old Testament. Uh, there's a, a, a mythological type of character. Um, one of a kind. Don't know where he came from, had no descendants, and he just kind of appears and disappears, and people were just, you know, this mythology behind Melchizedek became this image of, of this great high priest and so forth. Okay, so um, there really is not a lot in the Old Testament about Melchizedek. There's more this reference to him as this, this shadowy, uh, mythological, larger-than-life character in the Bible oftentimes. And it, so you just mention that word, and all of a sudden, oh, okay, Melchizedek. Ooh, mysterious. Ooh, okay. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to one who could save him from death. He was compassionate because he went through all the stuff that you and I go through. Okay? He was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, we learned that last week, he learned obedience from what he suffered. So he became one with us through his suffering and death. Now, so he's gone through all of that that every other high priest has done, but here's where it takes a turn. This is why Jesus is qualified to be not just a high priest, but the great high priest. Once he's made perfect, oh, listen to this, verse 9, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. It was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So now Jesus becomes this larger-than-life mythological person. The next greater than Melchizedek. He supplants him. And the great news is this is somebody to whom we can come. Aaron had descendants people have fallen in his footsteps, but Jesus, like Melchizedek, is one of a kind. No heirs, no descendants in that way. No one will ever have to take up the role of high priest again, because now it's in the hand of the, the great high priest, the one with the boldness to go to the throne of God and sit on the throne. Who in the world would have that type of audacity to sit on the throne of God? Well, Jesus does. He's the only one now that's necessary. There's no more need for high priests. Now, I say this because at this time it seems like right around here at the time of the writing of Hebrews, or just after it, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So where are the Jews going to go? They go to Jesus. We don't need no stinking temple made with human hands. We can approach the throne of God with boldness. This is a profound way of thinking. I think those of us who are Christians kind of take this for granted and we hear it all the time and don't realize how amazing this is. How revolutionary this concept is. We don't need no stinking high priests on earth. We don't need no stinking temples made with human hands. We can go with boldness to the throne of God because the 
true bold one, the great high priest, is sitting on the throne that was once covered by a veil. It's now been opened up for you and for me. Jesus is the only one necessary. No more high priest. Jesus is the end of the line in the beginning of new life. <laughs> this is fantastic, isn't it? I love the book of Hebrews, and I hope you're getting that, that excitement too. I hope it's catching. It's such a profound book. There's such deep and rich theology here. I want to leave you with this. The great high priest, appointed by God, compassionate to us because he struggled with us, became the one. He became one with us and ultimately the one through whom salvation was gifted to the world. There is no other. There need be no other. You can place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. Now I say that to my brothers and sisters, our cousins in faith, if they be Muslim or Jews, if they be um, Hindus or Buddhists, you have so much wisdom that we have to share with you. We have one thing, just one thing, one only thing, is it? We can be pretty dumb in everything else, but the one thing we have to share to you is God has made a way for you to boldly approach the throne of God And that one way is Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we, we are so privileged that we become numb, I think, to who this gift of Jesus is. Open up in our hearts that freshness, that newness, that excitement of what it means to be loved by the Almighty God that you would send to us the one and only great high priest, that we could approach your throne with boldness and receive your grace and your mercy. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.